started and I'm very pleased to uh, have uh, Bill Easterling here. He's the assistant director for uh, geoscience at NSF. And before that, he was, uh, uh, are you an IPA? I mean, you're on loan, right? Or, I am IPA. Right. Okay. So he's, he, uh, he was a dean at uh, Penn State University and a professor there in the College of, uh, oh, what is it here? Earth, Earth, and, Mineral Sciences. Earth and Mineral Sciences. And so uh, uh, I'll just turn it over to Bill. Thank you, everyone, and uh, sorry to be uh, a few minutes late. Uh, NSF now is located, as you probably know, across the river and now south almost all the way to the uh, southern edge of Alexandria. And with the metro out um, for the uh, next two months, it makes travel into the district uh, just as unpredictable as the climate. So it's uh, it's 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 always um, good to come get where you're going within five minutes of when you wanted to be there. Um, so uh, today um, I, I wanted to um, spend a little time um, in the beginning just um, talking about some of the things we have uh, underway at, um, at NSF broadly and specifically in the earth sciences and, um, and geosciences um, at NSF. That, that I believe relate to the, uh, the task at hand here with this committee. And um, let me just uh, assure you the work that you're, you're doing here is absolutely critical to where we would like to take um, the geosciences and earth sciences program um, at NSF. And, and I frankly couldn't be happier with the, uh, the quality of this committee when I saw it being assembled. I, I thought this is, this is truly um, the right people at the right time for uh, what, what, we've, um, what we've put on the table for you. Um, I know many of us go back um, a few years, and, um, and I, I look very much um, forward to um, the new insights and perspectives that we'll get from this group going forward. So over the next few minutes, um, I'd like to reflect on the importance of partnerships as the source. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, just the importance of partnerships as the source of uh, cooperation and collaboration across the earth sciences, the geosciences directorate, um, and then NSF uh, broadly. Um, before I begin, um, I also want to thank um, Lena to my left and um, Nisa Call and uh, Beth uh, Zelensky for assembling the, the story that I'm uh, about to tell. I, I have a prepared text, um, and um, as an academic, I, I, I kind of bristle at um, you know, being harnessed into a, a prepared text, but trust me, it's the only way that I'll get done in time and leave time for, uh, for questions. Um, I, I, I won't be able to resist in spite of what I just said, um, deviating and elaborating so on some points. And so to, to my handlers here, uh, Jim, if you'll um, please let me know if I begin to eat into time that, uh, that you really wanted to spend um, in uh, questions and, and answers. So, so John Muir got it right when he wrote, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. The fact is, Dynamic partnerships, whether between researchers, disciplines, institutions, or sectors, are pervasive models that ensure rapid advances on some of the toughest scientific challenges that we face. Partnerships not only enable the sharing of knowledge, resources, ingenuity, they connect science with society. And um, I'd be more than happy to um, talk with you about how important it is now, even in the uh, institutions that uh, support fundamental curiosity-driven science to stay connected with, um, with society and the work that we do. Today, partnerships are not only transforming our communities, but our notion of science itself. They're bringing every participant and every discipline into an increasingly interconnected future. 
I will say it several times over the next several minutes, the Earth Sciences Division has embraced the power of partnerships. And I'll give some examples to illustrate that. Uh, to begin, it's important to point out what almost all of you, probably all of you around the table already knew. Uh, the National Science Foundation is, in essence, a partnership of partnerships. We actively encourage, support, and facilitate those unions that Muir uh, talked about in his vastly interconnected universe. There's not another agency with NSF's capacity and skill to promote and manage complex systems. And I want to give you some examples to illustrate that. The connections that we can foster enable partners to work on projects that are too large, too complex, or too expensive for one group to tackle on their own. They allow each partner to do what it does best while remaining a part of something much more diverse and comprehensive in scale. Today I'll give a few examples that illustrate this concept um, in action from NSF's uh, <coughs> geosciences uh, portfolio. And we'll start local and move up to the international in scale. An enormous body of research details the importance of a diverse and inclusive scientific community. In fact, I've seen it um, projected um, several times that the, the geosciences workforce that we project into the future will not find all of the uh, people uh, that we need to uh, be in it um, if we are not successful in increasing the diversity of the geosciences. This was an enormous challenge um, when I was dean of the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences at Penn State, and I suspect it's uh, true at every single one of your institutions. Um, I started out as dean uh, 12 years ago, and I, I, one of, one of the, the, the places where I wished I had made more progress was in diversifying uh, the geosciences. Uh, geos cross-cutting opportunities for leadership and diversity, or gold as we call it, um, supports a different approach to increase participation and belonging. One supported project uh, we call Aspire is truly worth its weight in gold. Uh, this project supports mobile working groups to tackle local environmental change and severe weather risk to target and benefit communities most affected. This team studied the fragile Pearl Harbor aquifer threatened by agriculture, climate change, and urban sprawl. And these projects are co-reviewed and co-funded by program officers across all of GEO, including the front office and each of the divisions. A foundation-wide um, program, GEOPATHS, is improving STEM undergraduate education pathways in the U.S. GEOPATHS taps the nation's diverse student talent pool interested in pursuing degrees in the geosciences. These projects engage students in authentic, career-relevant experiences, like these college students participating in the GEO Launchpad internship. They are surveying the St. Mary's Glacier near Idaho Springs, Colorado, using GPS. Now let's take a second just to celebrate the 80 recently announced Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, or PCAS awards, supported by NSF. The president kicked off our nation's Independence Day celebration this year with a press release announcing our winners. Six of those awardees are supported by the Directorate for Geosciences. Here's a photo of a ghost forest I borrowed from Dr. Matthew Kirwan, one of the winners funded by the Earth Sciences Geomorphology and Land Use Dynamics Program. Dr. Kirwan uses ghost forests as an indicator of sea level rise, which is a major research priority in the geosciences. Now let me turn to a new program that I know you want to hear more about, and I'm going to spend some time um, describing this to you, and that's um, our Coastlines and People, or COPE, program. 
It's, um, it's cross-agency. Uh, it's interdisciplinary. Uh, and as I said, we call it coastlines and people or COPE. Um, and it really does demonstrate GEO's, especially um, Earth Sciences, commitment to large-scale convergence research. GEO is leading the way in collaboration with several other directorates. The evolution of COPE is in itself a textbook story of cross-directorate cooperation. When, when I arrived at NSF a little over two years ago, I started a uh, conversation with the division directors across the earth sciences, uh, across the geosciences, and, um, and we, we looked at what stands as our uh, kind of um, strategic roadmap in, um, in GEO and, and asked the question, you know, what, what are the next questions that we haven't fully addressed or that are just over the horizon that we ought to be um, paying some attention to and starting new initiatives to, um, to, 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 um, to initiate? And, um, and in that conversation, um, we started to hear um, common sets of interests across the, uh, the divisions, sea level rise, understanding why it varies as much uh, geographically, uh, the characteristics of severe storms as they um, move out of a marine into a terrestrial environment, especially as they interact with uh, highly urbanized land covers. Um, we, we, we heard a lot about um, better um, understanding of um, transocean land um, tectonic activity um, and how to better predict earthquakes, major earthquakes and uh, tsunamis. And it, it, it began to become very clear that these were all geophysical hazards um, in and around coastlines and especially highly um, urbanized coastlines. And that became the, uh, the basis, the foundation for um, what turned into a uh, cross NSF wide um, initiative to try to better understand these hazards and to integrate the engineering sciences and the social sciences, the life sciences to understand how best to take information we learn from um, these geo, geo hazards um, to uh, cr um, make a more resilient coastal community and set of ecosystems and a more resilient uh, urban infrastructure um, as a result and do this in a highly integrated um, way. So the earth sciences are providing key leadership in COPE and, and in fact, one of the early co-leaders of the COPE initiative was um, EAR's um, Jen Wade. Uh, COPE's scientific vision is a set of research hubs that enable geoscientists to collaborate with engineers, biologists, social scientists, and cyber scientists better to understand and predict geophysical hazards occurring on densely populated coastlines and to improve the resiliency of coastal infrastructure and the people who live there. So the Dear Colleague letter um, and current capacity building uh, proposals are being co-reviewed and managed from program directors from almost all the directorates and offices at NSF. And we can see that list here. We've also had a fruitful uh, conversation with other agencies, including uh, NOAA, DOE, and USGS about this focal er focus area. And I, I'm um, about to um, travel up to um, the NOAA offices to meet with um, Nicole LeBouf, who's the Assistant Administrator for Ocean Services, um, to begin to put together the teeth of a, um, of a collaboration with NOAA on um, funding proposals uh, jointly in, um, in COPE. So this program's development is um, timely, but it's extremely important for the nation. Climate change is raising sea levels while also changing the intensity um, and severity of, um, of major coastal storms. 
Um, these changes threaten two-thirds of the world's mega cities. A mega city is a city of at least 10 million people. There are about 25 of them on Earth, and um, easily two-thirds or perhaps more are located um, on or very close to coastlines. This wave crashes on a boardwalk in the densely um, populated city of Mumbai that you can see on the slide uh, behind me. This financial heart of India is the world's fastest growing major economy. Uh, military installations um, are, uh, many of them are along coastlines and are um, extremely vulnerable to um, all manner of geophysical hazards. Um, exposure to climate shocks like heat waves, drought, hurricanes, and flooding also threatens at least half of all U.S. military installations located within coastal zones. There are more than 1,700 bases worldwide that are near coastlines. Let me illustrate the importance of coastal population growth in the U.S. and why that's such an important ingredient in, um, in COPE. The U.S. population continues to migrate to coastal areas. This map illustrates homes built in the U.S. before 1950. The darkest maroon areas illustrate the highest concentration of U.S. households who live mostly in the U.S. Uh, heartland. Urban sociologists um, and demographers have shown us a very important trend after 1950. The maroon areas now depict a mass migration to U.S. coasts. From 1970 to 2010, the population of coastal counties increased by almost 40 percent. By the latter third of this century, looking worldwide, nearly 75 percent, three quarters of um, all of the world's population will live within 100 kilometers of, uh, of coastlines. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can hear it sort of in the background. <laughs> Not a problem. The uh, we're still working out the kinks in the uh, systems at uh, NSF, and this is one of the problems: is feedback on. Until <laughs> well said. Well, one last quick uh, map. Um, this one overlays NOAA's predicted sea level rise and coastal risk data on top of the last census. Um, the darker the blue, the the more people. If you look along the coastlines, the red areas are most susceptible to rising sea levels. Orange and yellow areas are at medium risk, but are in no way out of the woods. The take-home message is that nearly 40 percent of the U.S. population today needs to be ready for the very real and uh, very personal impacts of sea level rise. I think that's very clear uh, that anyone in this room would accept. COPE stands as an opportunity for interdisciplinary re uh, research on really some truly wicked problems. NSF supported uh, four scoping workshops across the U.S. to connect academics with local stakeholders um, to inform the development of the program. This collage of uh, images from the workshops illustrates how fun and engaging idea labs can be. A Dear Colleague letter um, soon followed the workshops in which NSF encouraged ideas to continue to build capacity and infrastructure research and education. The response, in my view, um, was higher than NSF had expected. And in fact, uh, COPE really has um, seemed to have struck a, uh, a nerve with the, uh, the science community. Um, we, the, we, we continue to get um, much more um, response than we even um, um, uh, anticipated out at the uh, edges of what we what we expected um, in in COPE. So so there's really a lot of uh, pent up demand to try to understand these problems. 
given only a month's time to respond, we received um, hundreds of ideas um, in our dear colleague letter. Um, program directors and management from all the participating directorates are collectively reviewing submissions and making funding recommendations as we sp as we um, as we sit here. Programs like COPE aren't just created out of thin air. They have legacies and um, they're grounded in a rich tradition in the geosciences and geoprisms is a textbook case. Um, geoprisms provided us with decades to uh, practice co-management of programs. Geoprisms is an earth and ocean science partnership and the acronym is short for geodynamic processes at rifting and subducting margins. And just as an aside, little did I know um, when I was still dean of uh, the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences at Penn State that my colleague uh, Damian Safer would, um, at, when he became head of um, geoprisms, would be basically laying out the groundwork for something that I would then inherit at NSF and, um, and, and really uh, be quite proud of. Geoprisms has uh, led to groundbreaking work, as I'm sure most of you know, regarding the architecture of uh, continental margins at fault lines, including what controls geohazards such as earthquakes and volcanoes. Here, University of Alaska Fairbanks professor Jeff Benowitz and um, graduate student uh, Kaylin Davis uh, collect five million year old volcanic ash deposits from the Wrangell Glacier, um, I'm sorry, volcanic arc uh, deposited in the Alaska Range. The um, RV Sekuliak has been paramount in distributing and recovering electromagnetic receivers deployed on the seafloor, allowing scientists from 11 institutions to study the Aleutian Arc. The Arc forms the northern part of the Ring of Fire, as I know you all know, um, very common um, uh, prelims uh, question, um, <laughs> where many of Alaska's 130 uh, volcanoes are uh, located. We don't have to travel far to reach the Pacific Coast outcrops on Unalaska Island. Uh, Dr. Mary uh, Kai provides scale by standing in front of these formations. I think they're pretty impressive. The modeled appearance of the pillow lavas in this lower outcrop were formed prior to the effects of crustal thickening by magnetism and tectonics. These processes eventually led to the emergence of the large islands that we see in the eastern Aleutians today. And let me move on to another major um, program that um, GEO really had um, as much uh, leadership as any of the directorates, and that was um, our innovations at the uh, nexus of food, energy, and water systems. It's another partnership working to understand and improve the nation's interconnected resources. I personally have worked in the area of climate change and food security, but I was always haunted by the fact that um, while we often dealt with the, uh, the limiting factor of water globally as climate changes, um, we, we didn't really make the connections as explicit as we needed to um, to energy systems, and they are such highly connected parts of a whole that that has been a real shortcoming in our integrated assessments of the consequences of climate change. And um, Infuse is truly one of the first, maybe the first, um, studies or uh, initiatives to look at this as a interconnected uh, system. The implementation of INFUSE was grounded um, in a strong partnership between NSF and USDA's National Institute of uh, Food and Agriculture, um, NIFA, NIFA, and, um, and for those of you who stay up on Washington politics, um, you may know that um, NIFA is um, in the process of being moved out of um, Washington um, 
to some location out in the uh, the country, um, and uh, that's yet to be fully finalized. But um, it will it will send certainly a shockwave through um, some of our partnerships. But we will continue to reach out and work with uh, with our partners at USDA. Infused supported research led uh, to uh, greater focus on systems thinking and approaches. That's 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 a, a phrase that you hear very often at NSF is systems analysis, systems thinking. Um, just a, an aside, we are truly the only science agency in um, in the Washington um, constellation that focuses especially on understanding um, the interactions between sectors and, um, and, 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 and truly trying to understand systems as systems of systems. The integration of the social systems uh, with uh, the scientific systems is a trademark of what we do um, in Infuse and also in other programs across the, uh, the, direct, the, uh, the foundation single and multi-institution collaboration. Any of you who have been PIs um, on NSF uh, projects um, recognize the importance of uh, collaboration with your, um, with colleagues at other uh, universities and research institutions. And um, discipline, interdisciplinary um, diverse teams um, are also characteristics. So let's broaden the, the reach with a couple of quick international examples um, of, of collaboration at NSF. NSF and the U.S. Israel Binational uh, Science Foundation have a memorandum of understanding on research cooperation in place. We just um, hosted a team from Israel back uh, last month to um, reinforce that um, memorandum of understanding. And in short, this means that U.S. researchers receive um, support from NSF and Israeli researchers receive funding from the uh, BNSF to cooperate. In short, I'm sorry, um, it's working well uh, for Dr. James Smith at Princeton. He's working with Israeli scientists in two geographically distinct settings to better understand the physical mechanisms controlling extreme floods in about 50 watersheds. The New River floods out of its banks in the background, and the flooding model data from the work uh, is inset. A wide range of users, including emergency management offices, regional planning programs, and flood forecasting offices are interested in these results, so it has real-world applicability. These researchers submitted a single collaborative proposal that underwent review at NSF as the lead agency. All the GEO divisions participate in this agreement, including, of course, EAR. If we move around the globe to the east, Utah State University geoscientist uh, Dr. Tammy Rittenauer works with scientists in southern Taiwan to explore the interaction of climate-driven erosion, tectonics, and topography. NSS partner for this funding is the Department of Natural Sciences and Sustainable Development of the Taiwan Ministry of Science and Technology. We just hosted the minister, the science minister of Taiwan at NSF last week. I uh, spoke, in fact, um, at length about the activities of this uh, committee to, um, to the minister. He was uh, quite interested. The Division of Earth Sciences will evaluate the outcomes of this partnership agreement by analyzing the number of proposals, success rates, and other metrics for fiscal years uh, 19 and 20. So coming up, these partnership examples demonstrate how effectively and efficiently GEO's program managers collaborate and cooperate. Program staff regularly suggest reviewers and panelists to each other. They co-manage joint proposals during panels, and they provide co-funding for the best and brightest ideas. That's the NSF way. Program directors and management from the divisions interact often 
outside of the proposal sharing space as well. They serve together on committees across GEO and NSF. It is simply not true that if a proposal is considered by two different programs that it is less likely to be funded. That is urban legend. In fact, the opposite is true. We encourage PIs to email program directors of the relevant programs at the same time. This helps NSF staff to confer and to provide the best and most efficient response. Let me digress for a moment and really hammer this point home. We, we at NSF have um, spent a lot of time exploring ways to manage the proposals that we receive, recognizing that we've been flooded with uh, proposals. Um, workloads are very high. But as we have experimented with the no deadlines approach, which uh, the Geosciences Directorate pioneered, um, we have seen a um, drop in the number of proposals. And by any of our measures, we've seen no corresponding drop in the quality of the proposals that we've received. So we continue to fund very, very good science. But what this has created is even more time for program officers to um, thoughtfully handle the um, proposals uh, that we receive that um, may not seem fully appropriate for um, the original addressee, but um, could be um, supported elsewhere in the foundation and to work with um, program officers in other parts of the, um, of the directorate and sometimes in other directorates to um, make sure that the proposal is given a fair hearing. And, um, and we often join together in the funding of proposals in that manner. So you see the mouse here and, um, and, and it's my cue to say that uh, to be successful and it, to advance society and technology, Activities require partnerships at every level, from PI to program director, organization to organization, and from discipline to discipline. We recognize the value of information sharing, planning, and networking, and we're strong supporters of workshops, conferences, ideas labs, and countless other collaborative and interdisciplinary endeavors. Networks advances science and technology and bridge gaps among the disciplines. Often the most fertile fields of discovery and transformative ideas are found at the blurry lines where the disciplines intersect. And I know most of you have worked in that blurry area. That brings us full circle to our newest cross NSF um, thrust, and that's in the area of convergence science. It's one of NSF's 10 big ideas. NSF and its partners in the scientific community use convergence to define a vision for a future where researchers across disciplines collaborate to solve grand challenges. Today you can find NSF support for convergence science in many of our longstanding programs but we're stepping up our investment in this area. We're providing funding for convergence research that falls outside of NSF's current programs and initiatives. We want to see what happens when multidisciplinary teams apply creativity and ingenuity to come up with research questions that we <laughs> once thought unimaginable. Now some of you may hear that and think that I just defined interdisciplinary research. That's certainly how I thought about it when I first heard the term convergence science uh, described to me. That's truly a related idea, but convergence is much more specific. It requires starting efforts to solve specific, compelling problems with deep, intentional integration across the disciplines from the very beginning. That word intentional is important 
We're not talking about a geoscientist producing research and then collaborating with an engineer or a social scientist to expand on it or taking existing models in one area and just thinking of um, clever ways to um, link mo that model to another model in another area and saying that that has achieved interdisciplinary um, um, insights. We're talking about purposely bringing together intellectually diverse researchers and even stakeholders from outside of the traditional research community to frame questions and to figure out how to answer them. And it brings to bear an arsenal of powerful new research methodologies, and this is another key trait to convergent science. These are methods such as data mining, geospatial information analysis, and GPS technology, just to name a few. This will be important as we tackle some of society's most pressing questions like how to deal with a rapidly warming Arctic. It's no surprise that navigating the new Arctic is another one of NSF's big ideas. Navigating the new Arctic supports research at the nexus of natural, social, and built environments um, in a rapidly changing Arctic world. Success for this big idea requires international collaboration, interdisciplinary and convergent research, and multi-stakeholder involvement. Navigating the New Arctic, or NNA for short, tackles scientific challenges in the rapidly changing Arctic to inform the economy, security, and resilience of the nation. These are major um, White House uh, priorities, and um, it, we want to learn not just for the benefit of this nation, but for the larger region and the globe. NNA seeks innovations in Arctic observational networks and fundamental convergence science. I'd be happy at the end to talk about some of the um, really exciting work that we're uh, trying to um, cultivate in the area of um, smart observing uh, technologies uh, that give us the opportunity for the first time to actually see what's happening under the ice and, um, and, and, and observe it and, um, and model it. NNA promotes initiatives that empower new research communities it also diversifies the next generation of Arctic researchers. It integrates the co-production of knowledge and engages partnerships, particularly among international stakeholders. Collectively, the, big, the 10 big ideas will identify and close gaps, push the boundaries of knowledge, and we hope will seize new opportunities in science. Implementing the big ideas requires strong partnerships across all NSF organizations, across scientific disciplines and communities, and across government agencies. A novel structure was developed for reviewing and awarding big idea grants that combines program officers from multiple directorates so that no single directorate controls the awards. That is a truly novel way um, NSF has developed for um, evaluating and then finally making the decisions for funding on truly interdisciplinary cross-directorate um, uh, grants. NSF and GEO will continue to invest in fundamental research, so let me assure everyone here that this foray that we um, have set out on at NSF in uh, big science interdisciplinary programs is, um, is just simply part of our portfolio, an important part, a new part of our portfolio, but we will continue to be the, uh, the agency that um, you go to when you have, when you're just simply curious about something about how the world works and you want some support and you can compel through the merit review process the, 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 um, 
the, the merits of a um, of a grant, and then you're off on your own doing um, deep disciplinary dives into some important questions. So that is still part of our portfolio. We're not moving away from that. We're simply diversifying. We'll continue to divest in uh, new technologies, observing capabilities. I think I made that clear just a few moments ago. Facilities and data needed to conduct um, the, the earth science that uh, interests us all in this room, and also the next generation of scientific um, and engineering uh, workers. The future of the geosciences and earth sciences is, in my view, on firm foundation, um, and it's built with solid partnerships across the agency and across uh, multiple agencies in multiple countries. This way of working will carry science and technology um, well into the future. It has to. That's the model that we're all moving toward. And thank you again for this opportunity to speak. We really, truly appreciate all the work that you're putting into this endeavor. And um, I look forward to um, seeing what this committee produces and hearing its advice. So I want to close now and leave time for any discussion or conversation that you'd like to have. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bill. That was uh, very, very interesting, and we appreciate the time you took to, uh, to come and speak to us. And I'm, I imagine there's some questions around the room, and um, so it's open for questions. Uh, Dennis, and then Bill. Yeah, thanks. The uh, on a small topic, the deadlines and the lack of deadlines and proposal, you describe uh, that it's actually increased the workload for your program. No, no, increased. other way around. It I has decreased. Decreased. Yeah. Well, okay. If I may augment that, it's been decreased to manage the review. Thank you. It's decreased to manage the review process because there are fewer proposals. Mm -hmm. To, to send out for review or to take to panel, that what has done is it's open a space for program directors right. to be engaged in other types of activities that all alone had been part of the description of their job, but because the time-sensitive review process needed to take place, those other activities were not done with as much deep thought in some cases or not have time. I remember when I got to NSF in 2005, program directors used to go and do site visits to projects. And that practice decreased um, in, in 10, 15 years. It was because the workload increased. Now people are having more time to re-engage in kind of in a more um, mindful way with the community. And I think that's what Bill was indicating. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dennis, if I, if, if I didn't make that clear. Um, the, 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 it is very clear to me um, after two years um, in my position that um, I've seen um, just the overworking of the, um, of the NSF uh, workforce, the program officers. Um, they, they really are just racing uh, to stay up. And, um, and so as, as with all of us when we're, um, you know, being uh, worked to the edge of our capacity, um, we have to make important um, decisions and trade-offs. And in, 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 in the, the period in which we were um, working with deadlines and we had a, a flood of proposals coming in, um, program officers just didn't have the time to be able to um, reach out to uh, other parts of the uh, organization and have meaningful uh, conversations. I mean, they did happen, but they were brief and they weren't always effective uh, to try to um, handle proposals that cross over domains. Um, but um, with the no deadlines um, in place, we, we are seeing um, that sort of freeing up of time that allows uh, program officers to do what they really want to do, um, and that's to be responsive and um, and to handle these uh, proposals um, as carefully and give it as many give a proposal as many opportunities to be funded as possible, given the the strength of the merit review. Uh, Bill, <clears throat> Bill Dietrich. <laughs> yeah. 
I have a, a couple questions that I think are relatively short, but maybe not. Uh, the first one is that <clears throat> yesterday we heard from uh, NASA, uh, Earth, Earth Science, and we didn't hear from DOE, but DOE is also a big player in the things that um, uh, GEO does. <clears throat> I was interested that you described going to meet with NOAA and working out a plan with them. And it's, it's been a discussion of, um, is there a, an effort underway to connect more with NASA, NASA, Earth Science and Interior, or connect more with DOE's programs, which have um, a lot of similarities, but they may also have, you know, uh, a desire to keep separate. I mean, it's it's because their their list of seven questions, Earth Science and Interior, is very much shared with ours. They provide information that NSF scientists produce. I was on the um, ESAS. Uh, decadal survey, and it was very clear NSF scientists were describing the goals for you, uh, the um, NASA. Um, or, so there was a, very much a loop, but I, you still get the feeling that there's not direct collaboration, that there's still a separation. Is that am I, is my impression right? And is there an opportunity there to get stronger ties with those two agencies? Well, l l let me um, let me address DOE first yeah. because yeah. Um, I'm I'm still you know warm to the touch from a <laughs> meeting that I had with um, Gary Garnard from um, from DOE who um, oversees the uh, the climate modeling. Yeah. Um, Exactly. program at um, at um, at energy and um, he he and I have developed a very strong uh, relationship um, largely over um, their mutual interest in um, in coastlines and people and uh, they they would like to join forces with us and um, they're particularly interested you may have remembered my mention of um, of what happens to um, severe storms as they um, cross from ocean to land um, and especially begin to interact with um, with urban cities systems. They want that um, new knowledge um, to be built into some of the uh, high-resolution climate models. And so we've talked about um, and are on the edge of committing to a, um, a, a kind of a, a joint um, review program um, that will uh, fund science in that area in the coastlines and people um, uh, um, framework. And uh, for NASA, I mean, I'll let Lena speak specifically to the Earth Sciences and what we've uh, done with NASA recently. But before I, before I turn the mic over to her, um, we've certainly worked very closely um, with NASA on uh, the development and implementing of uh, CubeSats in yeah. oh, the, uh, okay. the upper atmosphere and okay. uh, ionosphere and, and and, and almost all of our solar terrestrial physics um, work is closely uh, tied okay. to uh, to NASA. We work very closely in the uh, the new um, CubeSats um, planning program for um, geospace sciences uh, with NASA. So we're pretty closely linked in that way in GEO. I think uh, you heard yesterday that um, NASA provides um, funding for um, GAGE. Yes. So UNAFCO right, does of kind of one of the yeah. larger facilities in the division. Yeah. And then that kind of is one of the, um, through those facilities we have a lot of federal conversations because the federal agencies do use some of our facilities either to store data or to use the data to meet their mission. So we have regular conversations in this uh, phase. The fact that you may not see an infused type of partnerships where there is a con concrete solicitation that doesn't mean that we don't interact with uh, agencies with some regularity. There are formal working groups that some of our program directors that I participate in around town. And then there is the informal conversation that many times happens when a proposal arrives and it looks too much like NASA or whatever, and then there is a phone call. So we do interact with the agencies at the formal and informal level, depending on the opportunity. They have their missions. They may have more um, fingerprints of a political um, sense around town. NSF is pretty much, we are an independent agency, so we don't see that. So the nature of some collaborations may, may change based on that, but we are mandated 
to always collaborate with uh, other agencies. And we don't do it because we have to, but we see the benefit to understand the Earth. And I really like Mary's comment yesterday. We should stop talking about NASA researchers and NSA researchers. We should talk about our science researchers, and they have different funding opportunities. And then we should be talking about how to best advance our sciences as a whole. Yeah, I'll come back around. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Bill, for those remarks, and Lena for being here again today. Um, so one of one of the things that we heard yesterday, there's there's been a lot of um, uh, there were a lot of questions and discussion about uh, the role of these integrated activities. And um, what emerged yesterday that was interesting is that um, NSF views these things like Infuse and Cope as being um, these you know, new programs that are perhaps short-lived, at least in terms of their name, but then ultimately drive innovation in the core programs within um, both EAR and the other divisions. Um, and I wonder if you could provide some specific examples, you know, since Infuse is relatively new about how, how that has sort of changed potentially some of the sort of um, core solicitations of the core programs in EAR um, and, and what your vision for, um, you know, when ultimately COPE graduates, you know, how that, you know, how the core programs, things like, you know, hydrologic sciences or geophysics might sort of look different or might, might be, um, you know, might innovate to sort of take advantage of and be receptive to some of the new um, technologies, models, data, um, theoretical frameworks that might arise from the work that gets funded through COPE. Thanks. I mean, this is something that um, we think a lot about is, um, you know, we, we, we start out by asking where did we come from um, and, um, you know, what kind of foundation are we building when we launch a new program like uh, Infuse? And um, and then um, we, we I, I can't confess that we are always thinking, you know, next steps that far out that we are trying to anticipate what comes next on um, on a brand new program. Um, but um, but but we always, as programs, do begin to start to sunset. And um, and and let me, if I could, just digress a moment and um, and talk about sunsetting, um, because um, it's rare that I um, go into um, a, um, a review panel and, um, and sit and speak with them, that um, at some point um, the um, panelists will ask, well, why is it that um, we're getting momentum, we're, we're building a, um, a cadre of scientists we're building capacity um, in this important research area. And just as we're getting to um, peak performance, um, NSF pulls the plug and sunsets the program. And, and you know, and I have to say that, that you know, as, a, as an investigator myself um, and a dean, um, I asked those questions uh, when I sat on the panels and I couldn't understand the, the logic. But the logic's very simple. You know, we're always pushing ahead. We're always asking new questions. Uh, you, the community, are, um, are, are, you know, pushing us always to um, look at what's next over the horizon. And um, in, a, um, in, a, in, in a nearly flat funding environment, um, we just simply have to make uh, tough choices. And, um, and so, uh, you know, and, and we sleep well at night with this, I have to add, uh, because we, we recognize that, um, that we've, we start off a new research area and then um, it gains momentum and, um, and we, we, we anticipate that there will be other funding opportunities in other parts of the government. Um, sometimes industry, you know, that will pick up where we leave off and then we go off and do what we do best at NSF and that's ask the, the you know, leading edge questions. So um, in the case of, um, of Infuse, um, it, it's, it became very clear to us that, um, that, that though um, 
the novelty of the program was its linkage of energy, water, and um, energy, uh, water, and food, and that it was um, that novelty of that connection that um, that we wanted to explore. Um, but it, it also became clear to us that there are so many un resolved questions in the water um, sciences area that we really need to go back into water and, um, and, and advance our modeling capabilities and particularly joining the uh, terrestrial environment with um, and models that represent that environment with the water models. And so that's a very natural progression out of Infuse. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a, a preview of something that we're only really talking about right now. We haven't made any real commitments, but that is how it works. That's how we will move ahead. Um, it is likely that we will see something out of NSF that will put the focus on that interface of uh, terrestrial systems and, um, and water systems. Yeah, <clears throat> I, w I must say that this COP program is really exciting, and I think it's it's a, it's a really critical problem that's affecting the country in terms of flooding and sea level rise and effects on urban environments, agriculture, et cetera. Um, you mentioned the the importance of the military bases, uh, which are which are aligned particularly on the coast. And also, there was a recent article about about 2,500 sites in the United States along the coast that are heavily contaminated, and there are all sorts of questions about cycling of these materials. So my question is, um, it seems to me there could be some good opportunities to partner, for example, with Department of Defense, perhaps EPA. I wondered, in order to keep this program sustained and keep it going, I wondered if there had been any thought given given to those two agencies or other agencies in terms of partnering? Well, the answer is um, we've given some thought to it, Don, but we haven't really um, made that critical first gesture to um, DOD, um, at least not under the COPE um, um, you know, mantle. And so, um, you know, I take that as just very good advice that we really need to step up our game in that. It's partly because um, I, I don't think we've had a lot of interaction historically with DOD on issues like this. Um, you know, it's, it's really quite um, impressive how DOD has uh, entered the game um, on climate change, um, recognizing it as an existential threat and um and and really um y you know taking the issue very seriously and so i i suspect that um there's a fertile um you know field there to to plow but we we haven't gotten there yet and unless you know of something that i don't I might think about the corps of engineers and doe that might be the place. Yeah, I, you know, I have had conversations in a very brief um, meeting with the core, and um, and we haven't quite made the uh, the handshake yet. Yeah, I have a question for Lena and one uh, for Bill. Sure. Um, it related to uh, one to the NASA question. I understand that obviously you speak and you partner. There are emerging questions, however, and the fact that the Earth is a planet and to understand other planets and habitability, we really need to understand the Earth first, but that, that are, is there, my question is, is there an actual mechanism for programs that really work together, not just using their satellites or their data or whatever, but actually say understanding the origin of the Earth-Moon system is critical and that's it. It's a joint issue. So that's my question for you. Uh, my question for you, Bill, related to what Don said in terms of national security and also some of the things we've been thinking about here or I've been thinking about is that in your presentation, the earth sciences seems to me the essential science for this moment in time, right? Sort of the critical moment in time that we're at, the existential threat. We are uniquely pre poised as a science because of our intersection of basic and applied and interior and surface. And my question for you is, 
how can we help you or are there efforts to do a bit more PR a la NASA for explaining that to the funding uh, body? Right. Good question, but I'll defer to Lena for your first question. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, we, that is the, the space, nothing prevents us for the program directors and for myself reaching out to NASA and say, okay, the, the understanding of the, the moon generation or the early planetary body evolution is essential. Let's get together, let's figure out a mechanism. I'm, I'm a proponent of Ideas Lab, for example, where you commit to some funding level, but you bring people to the community that you think are essential to address a particular question, and you facilitate them talking about how to go about solving that question, and then you evaluate those proposals. So there are different mechanisms that we can partner in developing the tools target to a particular topic. So nothing will prevent us. They did, I think um, Mary indicated they ran an ideas lab on the original life, for example, several years ago. And for different circumstances, um, I don't know where the next step was on, on that one, but we can, we can talk about that. The importance of the earth sciences. Um, you know, this brings me back to some really um, great lunchtime conversations I used to have with Sue Brantley and Jim Casting and uh, Richard Alley on the uh, on this this topic. Um, of course, they were there to lobby the dean, but um, but they had a higher purpose. Um, and we talked about our systems, and um, and that's the key word that um, that that what I say will pivot on. Um, I, I believe that we're about to see um, NSF um, really take hold and and hopefully in the end um, take ownership of, um, of of the concept of Earth system science. Um, and, and I recognize that um, Earth system science is not a new concept. Um, I joined Penn State many years ago in part uh, because of its commitment to uh, studying the Earth as a system, but um, I, won't, I won't be so dramatic as to say that, well, somehow our system science sort of faded away, but I will say that it, um, it kind of receded a little bit um, in recent years, um, in part because of the tremendous growth and attention given to climate change and climate modeling and, um, and, and you know, in, in, in the earth sciences. Um, but um, but I, I have witnessed, and you probably have too, um, a real resurgence um, that is very organic across the earth system system or earth science disciplines, surely the solid earth sciences, if I might use that to separate that from other earth sciences like the atmospheric sciences um, and the oceans. But, um, but, but I really uh, believe that we're on the verge of, um, of, of a move toward uh, formalizing um, earth system science um, in, in um, the geosciences at, um, at NSF. And um, I don't want to go too far because I really think this is a conversation that uh, we're going to have to have with the research community. And, um, and it's not um, fully developed by any means, but, but I really see it as a, um, as, as a organizing uh, principle that we will not be able to ignore. Um, we need to have uh, you know, a thoughtful exchange with the community, um, maybe through a mechanism like uh, like this. Um, but but I think that the uh, that, that that a move toward Earth systems um, is an open invitation to um, all of the ocean, of the Earth sciences, and it um, it puts equal weighting um, in understanding the long uh, long time scale um, processes of the um, of the Earth. Uh, along with the uh, shorter um, processes, shorter term processes that are regulating the atmospheric chemistry and climate change and um, and and all the other aspects of um, of the earth system so um, so i I won't say that uh, the uh, the earth sciences will take primacy uh, 
but they will certainly be a crucial partner um, in, in in a move in that direction. So um, I've probably gone further than I had intended in answering that question, but uh, but I wanted to give you a glimpse of what we're thinking about at NSF. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Steve Jacobson from Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. You may have just answered my question, but if you don't mind, I'd like to ask it anyway, in which case you can say, well, what I just said. <laughs> but uh, first, by the way, another consequence of the removal of proposal deadlines, so I have heard, is an increase in the, the quality of the proposals. They're looking a little bit less rushed and uh, last minute. So that's another thing to, to bear in mind. That's good when the quality goes up. Um, looking at, uh, well, the interdisciplinary cross-cutting nature of our science is, of course, what a lot of us love about our, our field. Um, it also presents a branding difficulty or identity crisis. Um, I was struck by what you said about COPE in looking at subduction zone earthquakes and tsunami, sea level rise. Um, urban flooding and so on when you said you, you had this realization how much of this is geophysics mm -hmm. and I think that's really really important given um, we hope that our report you know will be read or at least skimmed by by people outside of NSF in Washington and being mindful of the importance of identity in establishing purpose um, and uh, federal funding I guess I would like to hear a little bit about what your experience in the first two years has been in Washington um, about how people view Earth science. That is, sometimes I have the sense that the, the like future 15-year-old scientist in the country today may have a better idea of what quantum computing or astrophysics is than they do what Earth science is. So we're just trying to be mindful of this as we write, knowing that people outside of NSF will read this. And so I wonder what your experience has been. If you, and maybe you, you just answered that for us, but this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Well, let me start at the general and move to the specific. Um, I, you, you all have seen a, um, a kind of, um, if I might use the term, sea change um, uh, in, in the sciences um, over the past um, you know, two decades or so toward um, what um, many of us in the Washington trade, science trade, call use-inspired uh, fundamental um, research, uh, where, where we, we and, um, and those of our stakeholders who provide our, our funding, um, Congress especially, um, recognize the importance of fundamental uh, research but they have become very impatient um, and would like to see um, more results um, faster um, if, uh, if that's possible and, um, and have asked the agencies to um, it devote at least a portion of their portfolios toward funding science that addresses some of these, um, you know, grand challenges that not only are scientifically interesting, uh, but they're also um, important to um, society to better understand. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I have um, spent a lot of time, especially um, up on the Hill, uh, talking to a number of, um, of um, elected uh, leaders who have, um, have shown um, a great deal of respect for and um, interest in the, the work that we do at NSF. Um, you know, for better or worse, and I, I almost say this hoping that it won't be quoted um, and put somewhere in your documents, but, uh, but for better or worse, um, I, I think we've um, found that at NSF, um, because we are able to articulate the work we do in highly scientific terms and, um, and explain why it's important to understand um, why the um, oceans um, are becoming um, you know why the why the thermohaline circulation is uh, changing, for example, in the um, in the Arctic. Um, 
is it, it is of great interest to um, to Congress, and um, and they are very supportive of the work that um, is is funded to answer those kinds of uh, challenges. Um, but we we don't just um, broadly um, advertise that it's all done to try to understand climate change um, in a way in which we can advise policy. Um, makers on the um, judiciousness of uh, managing carbon emissions. Um, if you see see the point I'm making, um, we stay clear of the policy and we stick to the science. And, um, and I think that there's a large appetite um, in Congress. And you may find this, what I'm about to say, interesting, but some of you probably know this already that it's, it's, it's both houses, um, but it's especially the uh, Republican House that, uh, or side of the uh, aisle that, that is often um, the most interested in uh, funding our science um, because they see it as a, um, a, an engine of economic uh, growth. So um, I think we, we have a um, natural ally, um, contrary to what you, know, you, you hear um, from you know inside all the you know the uh, the sources in the beltway um, a natural ally in um, in Congress and um, how else could you explain the fact that we have had um, two consecutive years of plus ups in um, the NSF and other science agency budgets and um, I won't speculate on what we'll get the coming years. But um, but things have really you know kind of turned around for us. So um, am I getting to the core of your question? They, know what Earth system science is. they do know what our system science is, but what they want to know is how can you help us not only uh, understand um, tsunamis and um, and you know transocean subduction uh, processes um, and better predict earthquakes. But but be able to use that information to um, protect constituents, and so we 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 I, we often find ourselves in front of um, of committee hearings um, where where those are questions that are being asked of us. Uh, can you d help us? Can you help us um, do better? with um, you know, the next Hurricane Maria? Um, can you help us do uh, better with the next um, you know, major um, earthquake in um, Southern California or anywhere in California, or anywhere in the country? I'm having fun. <laughs> this, is, this is just a quick one, point of information. Mike? I'm sorry? Oh, yes. <laughs> Just a point of information, I, and I'm sorry if you covered this in your presentation. Does the, is, is the coastlines and people's program also covering rivers and Great Lakes, or is it simply the marine coasts? Well, that's an e easy one. Um, yes, it covers the, uh, the Great Lakes. Okay. Um, we consider that a major coastline. And, um, and if you can make the scientific argument uh, persuasive and it passes merit review that the coast of the Mississippi River um, is important and we need to know something about it, then I would suspect that will also it's, be... It's called backwater. Backwater. Yeah. Okay. And it's big. Yeah. yeah. It goes a long ways up these low gradient rivers. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the same about a Hudson estuary. <laughs> I think I have two questions. The first one, um, and this comes from, I, I, I think the idea of these collaborative projects resonates with everyone in the room. It's Earth Systems, but I've myself been a part of these projects, both on the NASA and NSF side, where it's a huge collaborative project. It looks nice. There is a push for, we all work together and make something greater, and it really never amounts to anything greater than a sum of it's parts that could have been funded through basic research, through more basic, um, well, core programs. Um, so my question is, what is the, does the NSF use some internal metrics or studies? Because social scientists study this ad nauseum, corporate studies this ad nauseum. How do you assemble teams and how do you measure the success of these types of proposals? Um. Stab, and then I'm certainly uh, going to welcome uh, Lena to uh, to come into it as well. Um, 
you know, um, I was at a, um, a session that um, Marsha McNutt um, hosted um, at AGU last year, and um, and it, it it was you know provisionally it was about um, incorporating uh, the social scientists uh, into um, into the work of uh, the geosciences, and um, and and at one point um, we all kind of talked over the idea of um, why not let the social scientists. Um, who are involved in some of these big interdisciplinary um, research uh, team projects um, be the ones to frame the uh, the initial scientific questions that are uh, posed um, and you know at first um, you know there's a lot of um, huffing and um, you know how how dare we go down that path and then the more you thought about it you know of course this would presuppose that these are Connected and thoughtful um, and well-informed um, colleagues uh, in the social sciences um, who, who you know have experience working in this you know kind of um, environment with uh, other physical scientists um, that maybe this would be an interesting experiment to uh, to try um, and um, and and so we're hoping that um, in the instance of cope. That um, that kind of um, kind of reverse osmosis, if you will, of the the, the usual scientific process that, a as you may be inferring, starts with um, the 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 you know the the, the physical sciences uh, being done first, and you probably could either individually or in very small teams at a very reductionist level make a lot of headway in understanding a particular um you know problem but um but but you know in the end um you know having to try to you know connect that forward to um the life sciences and ultimately the social sciences um that that this sort of disruption of going in the opposite direction could be kind of an interesting experiment to try and this is the sort of thing that we would strongly encourage in uh cope and we're also hoping to see that kind of um, disruptive thinking in, um, coast, uh, I'm sorry, navigating the new Arctic. Um, so the, uh, Carolina just mentioned that there are uh, some common interest in research from different agencies, and uh, the example that uh, we talked about yesterday is about planetary geology and exoplanets, and Mary said this is a nobody owns, and uh, that would be interesting. And so the other um, area I think is pretty obvious that everybody owns is water, that um, I think that intersects almost every sector, every agency on this planet. Um, and and also um, geohazard and uh, energy. I think uh, you all mentioned those. And yesterday we heard from USGS and NASA that was uh, they're all pretty clear. And I was just wondering um, whether at the interagency level, um, both the EAR and GEO, um, any thoughts about be more proactive, um, seeking out um, potential partnerships and, and specific detail mechanism along that direction. And and then the other kind of follow-up similar question is within GEO that uh, um, uh, and they are navigating New Arctic, even though that's a cross-foundation uh, program, but having a GEO. And I think the um, the Arctic um, um, hugely intensely related to the water cycle. And I, I was wondering within GEO whether there are any thoughts about engaging um, directorate-wide initiatives or programs that um, are in that direction. So thank you, Chairman, because you've given me an opportunity to tell you something that I wanted to make sure I will tell you, and that relates to questions that Alejo and, and others have asked. So just give me five minutes, no, not even five minutes. 
Um, we had a hydrologic sciences program at NSF. It has been, I think, in the 90s is when it began, uh, and then it, it joined EAR. 2010, 2009, we, need, we, needed, we were going to know, have a portfolio on sustainability, and we knew that water was a key part to sustainability. So we had a program called uh, Water Sustainability and Climate, and, and the hydrologic sciences play a very important role in that. Through those projects, they realized that the issue may not have been, it was too broadly defined, water sustainability and climate. One of the key issues that came out was energy and food and water connection in this changing environment. All this time, hydrologic sciences program has continued. And the <laughs> program has evolved because there were questions in WSC, water sustainability and climate, that were not, they, needed a, they didn't need a social scientist, they didn't need these collaborative projects, that, uh, teams that were asked of these larger programs. There were some fundamental questions about hydrologic processes that needed to be understood to advance that other program. So those PIs will come to the hydrologic sciences program and then they could go back to those other teams and inform them on the results of these basic processes. So models will become more sophisticated and they will have better physics for their processes and all of that. So, and the same thing is with, uh, with Infuse, right? Now, what they have, we have learned from Infuse, as, as Bill was saying earlier, is that the modeling, the terrestrial modeling for, for water is really rudimentary, and it needs to be more sophisticated to really connect the, the food energy system. So, the interagency connection comes next. Tom Torgerson has been the representative for NSF through um, delegation uh, from the division director to take part in the subcommittee for water availability and quality. This is an interagency group, DOE, DOE is, is a key partner, the Army Corps of Engineers, EPA, Department of Interior, multiple agencies. There is going to be a workshop hosted at NSF that is mostly agency, researchers, and academics coming to talk about the terrestrial water model, what's needed, how we need to advance it. The agencies are coming because they need those models for their missions. The academics are coming for the research part. So this is an early conversation that we don't know where, I, I can imagine where this workshop may take us, and I will be glad to report back to you in two years what was the outcome and how did it connect <coughs> to hydrologic sciences at, an, at EAR and what other programs were um, created or came about because these needs came about. So that's, I just wanted to give you that full circle on how things have evolved in this particular space and, and Chimin's area it, it was perfect for that. And I forgot your other question on hazards. Um, it, 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 it's the same thing. The earthquake happened um, in a rich crest uh, uh, July uh, 4th. On, on July um, um, 7 or 8, we were on the phone with a team of agencies. They have a mission responsibility to talk to uh, communities, local stakeholders. We have capacity on instrumentation. The research community has um, capacity. We were part of that conversation. We are deploying our rapid awards. A um, couple of awards are being made there, and all of that is done in coordination through the response to, to this um, crisis. Can I ask to just re-summarize what I think you said, Lena, to make sure that we, I'm hearing this correctly. But so the view in part is that um, these integrated activities actually sort of help to unlock. So there, there's, there's goals to make progress in what the stated, you know, innovations of the nexus of food, energy, and water systems. But another maybe equally important goal is to sort of unlock where there are sort of fundamental knowledge gaps that need to be addressed in the core programs. Because those gaps are going to be highlighted in, in those areas, and then there will be space for the researchers to come. And, and let me also um, add that the, the these um, large interdisciplinary um, research in, um, programs um, are not disconnected from our 
our core programs. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we we are making a, a you know a certain amount of funding available to the core programs specifically to um, encourage their participation in the um, in the uh, large interdisciplinary um, research uh, programs. So, um, for example, um, in the um, navigating the new Arctic, um, we we would certainly expect um, to see um, participation from uh, everything from atmospheric and geospace sciences to uh, the ocean sciences for sure in understanding the geographic differences in sea level rise um, around the Arctic and um, and in you know building better integrated uh, models to uh, predict uh, where we're going from uh, from here into the future so 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 we we are not disconnecting um, the the basic fundamental science. Um, we're we're trying to um, have that exchange back and forth so that ultimately, when um, the Arctic navigating the new Arctic program um, has had its life and uh, goes away, um, it will have imprinted um, on the science that's being done in the uh, the core programs. I'm sorry, Jim. That was the other part of Jimmy's question: is, is NNA, and and of course, earth sciences is 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 right there as well, right? The rivers are, are coming on, bringing in more the sediment. The permafrost is alterations, signals in the soils from the soils is also a big component in NNA with uh, how the soils are evolving in in there. So earth sciences is is, is completed completed in there. The other part that I'm sorry to to take the time is that these programs are developed and managed by program directors that manage core programs. And in EAR, I like the people to be there because they know those basic questions that can come up. They know the language of their communities. You heard yesterday how important is the language. So for me, I'm not an advocate of bringing somebody completely independent from core programs to create these interdisciplinary programs. There are workload issues, and I'm mindful of that, and I, I will work with the staff to um, alleviate that piece as well, but they need to be engaged, if not driving this. Thanks. I'd like to return to a comment you made, Bill, earlier, um, which I think was part of the, I hope I'm not quoted on this. <laughs> um, so it really struck me that, that um, you said, you know, that when you're talking to people on the Hill and other federal agencies that you're valued because you can articulate the relevance of, of the work that this division is doing with respect to climate change and, and issues related to that, and that they're coming to you saying, can, can you help us with this? Yet at the same time, I understand you're not game to be throwing around the words climate change and carbon footprint and, and whatnot. I come from the state of Florida. I, I understand this landscape, <laughs> believe me. Um, and, and many of my colleagues feel the same way. They're not willing to, to go out there and get involved with the policy and say, no, I do the science and not the politics and I need to stay disengaged. Yet we're in this moment right now where the political discourse is changing in that instead of questioning climate change, we're actually finally having a conversation of what to do about it. Very much. So, so to me, I mean, this seems like this is a moment for us to get engaged. And, and it, it's, yes, it's political, but the fear is, the reason we have this fear is it's not because it's political. It's because it's been partisanized, right, which, which, is, which is the real issue. At the same time, there are 13 federal agencies who participated in the National Climate Assessment. And as you said, they, they get it. DOD understands climate change is a threat multiplier. So I guess my question to you is, is how can we better engage to help all these federal agencies grapple with this? We have the science and the scientists here, and, and that conversation needs to happen, and not being able to use the words or, or say those things does cripple us, right? And, so, and, and partly what can we do to help as a committee is, is something I'm really interested in as well. It's a fair point, and, um, and and let me be very clear here. Um, there, any 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 work that NSF supports, um, or any proposal that we uh, receive, 
um, will be funded on the basis of merit review, and um, and and it it could it could be a proposal that um, builds its arguments um, with um, use of the term climate change as a um, as a, as a scientific motivation. Um, and um, and it could liberally sprinkle that that word um, throughout the proposal, and the work that um, that that is done um, under the award um, similarly, and um, and it will be treated no differently from any other um, proposal that we receive at NSF. Um, and, and I hope that that point um, is is well understood and accepted because um, the you know word on the street is that. Um, you know, in some some corners, is that uh, well? You better watch out. If you use uh, climate change um, too much, you're going to get um, thrown into a auxiliary pile. You know, good science, but it's not the time for it. Um, that just simply isn't the case. Um, but um, it, if um, you know, and I, I, what I what I'm about to say is coming from a person who was the dean of a college that had a, had Michael Mann um, as one of my faculty members. I had a uh, monthly meeting with Mike, uh, always to be able to anticipate what might happen next, um, and I was never successful. <laughs> but uh, but um, you know. I, I recognize that this is the time to be doing important science um, that provides the substrate for um, policy decisions that will save countless lives and protect a lot of property and uh, and the health of of our fellow citizens and um, and that we have an obligation to to do that science um, but we also want to do the science um, in a way in which we continue to get the support of those who provide the uh, the funding uh, for us. Not that um, we should um, in any way subjugate what we want to, you know, do scientifically. Um, but I'm trying to. What I'm trying to say is, um, we we as scientists in the um, in the earth sciences um, are not necessarily the greatest people in the world to be suggesting um, policy decisions in fact i would i would um, argue that that as scientists um, in spite of the fact that mike mann uh, one of my colleagues likes to play in that arena that um, you know do that you know separately from the science that uh, is being conducted with um, with NSF support and um, and and that will guarantee that we will continue to not guarantee but it will make more likely that we will continue to be able to do the important work that helps us understand climate change and um, and gives us options um, you know for dealing with climate change, building in resiliency where it's needed, um, adapting um, to climate change where uh, where that's necessary, um, and it is necessary um, as we speak. Did I, I mean, did that clear? Yeah, I think so. I guess it's, it's still a challenge that um, knowing the best way for us to be able to help and engage not to make the policy decisions but to right. help advise as scientists without being afraid to do so right and right that's, right that's, um that's you know i i learned i learned through my experience with a um a, a non-advocacy think tank here in washington called resources for the future i was a fellow there and um and for those of you who know um rff it's it's a highly regarded um think tank um nonpartisan and um and its mantra was and it stuck to it um do the science um or organize the scientific knowledge base to be able to um inform policy decisions make the scientific case as clearly as possible uh, particularly to non-scientists but do not cross the line and make the policy um, decision for the policymakers, and um, and that's always driven my my philosophy of how far to go with the science that we do. Okay, 
Huntington University of Washington. Um, as a as a complement to this, so um, it's exciting that um, National Science Foundation is embracing on many levels youth-inspired science, and um, both because of its importance to our nation and also to the fundamental, how it feeds back into fundamental science. But And in the context of partnerships, it sounds like a lot of partnerships outside of NSF, but also sort of big initiatives within NSF. It seems like a lot of the collaborations are driven by or have the flavor of an element of youth-inspired work in there. And so I guess I'm, you know, as a contrast, I sort of inspired by some of the things like Carolina and others were saying, um, you know, astrophysics doesn't worry about uh, so much youth-inspired perhaps, and NASA does, but it also embraces their contributions to understanding the wonder and and mystery of the universe and world. And um, GEO and EAR, um, I guess I'm curious, in what ways are we, ident are, are we, are we really selling our identity um, as embracing our, our, our uh, contributions to the pure understanding of wonder of the world? And what opportunities for partnerships and collaborations, are there examples of, of really successful ones that are driven more by the wonder of the universe and the earth than use inspired or do you think that to be successful use inspired is is really part of the part of the mix that needs to be in a successful big um interdisciplinary thing or, or collaboration across the 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 foundation or outside well, it's another good question, and it's a tough one because um, I came into the job with um, the the premise that that Geo um, has not done a good job of communicating um, the value, however one defines value, um, of of the science that we do to um, the public um, to. Congress and um, and the White House, um, you know, really just broadly to all stakeholders on Earth. Um, we just simply have not done a good job of explaining why why it's important to understand um, how the Earth um, formed and all the processes that define the evolution of the Earth through um, Earth history and. Um, and you know, we we've kind of pa been painted into a box that um, uh, well, they're the they're the science of doom. They're the ones who um, uh, inform us about um, you know hurricanes and uh, earthquakes and um, tsunamis and uh, and and all the um, the the. the um, destructive um, things that we've done to the natural ecosystems of the planet. So um, we've got a lot of work to do, um, I, I think, to change that um, that that perception. And, um, and and of course, I'm 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 over dramatizing to make a point. Um, I do think that um, th that we're appreciated more than you think. Um, but um, but but particularly on on the issues of um environmental change um we we tend to you know be be put into um into that box um i i think that um we recognize this um in geo and we've um started a new um strategic communication plan um that um you know, for, for one thing, um, the front office uh, communications um, program for NSF, our Office of um, Legislative and Public Affairs, Political Affairs, um, has really not given uh, GEO the uh, the attention that I think we deserve historically. And and we we have started and really truly engaged um, that office to. Um, to, to you know more aggressively um, give them um, information that they can use and we're starting to see some results uh, from it and I might also say that um, I've been in conversations with um, Chris McEntee at uh, AGU um, to try to take advantage of um, the you know their big anniversary uh, that's coming up um, to um, jointly make a statement of um, just all the tremendous you know you talk about um, you know the um, 
the all the work that's been done with photographing the uh, the black hole, for example, um, in astronomy. Well, we have our black holes in um, in the earth sciences. They're um, you know plate tectonics and um, and you know some of the uh, major steps forward we've been able to take in forecasting um, you know severe storms and and, and the, you know they they don't quite you know, speak to the grandeur of the astronomical sciences, um, but they're very practical and um, and, and quite um, impactful uh, discoveries that have been made um, throughout history. And very few people, they hide in plain sight. Very few people know them and know these stories. And so we're we're going to try to lever off of uh, AGU to, um, to show what NSF has contributed um, with collaboration of uh, our major science societies like AGU over the years. So, so it's a big effort. Um, we recognize the problem, but it's going to take more than just my four years as um, AD to, you know, really start a new narrative for the geosciences. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and, and I think it's all of us, right? And Andrew was asking, what can you do? And it's, it's all of us who have to be out there and proud and celebrate all the discoveries we make, whether the discovery today is about a, a, a new um, property of a, of a mineral phase at a high pressure that we still don't know how that will translate later on, but maybe later on it becomes important phase on understanding nucleation of earthquakes, whatever it is, right? It's hard for us to, to predict. Who knew that a project funded in the 90s in tectonics about rock fracturing was going to be fundamental for fracking, right? So those, those are hard to do. My job as, as the current division director is to, to make sure we celebrate all the discoveries, all the accomplishments of our communities. And I go to every panel and I'm taking this opportunity asking you to let us know whenever you have a, a new discovery, if you see something that is going to be big, the, the sooner we let us know, the, the sooner we can start working with this office at NSF to make a big splash. The big hole, uh, uh, the black hole picture, it was in the, that story was in the making for a year. So it was not those just like I got my paper published and, and it's accepted now, now. No, they began working when the discoveries were being made. So please, please let your program director know, send us emails. I love to hear good news and this is coming this way. I, this was unexpected. Your students, your student is taking an unusual path. He became a lawyer and now he's doing whatever it is. Let us celebrate all of those accomplishments as much as the GRFs and all the other awards that we are recognized. Because we need to work all together to change the perception that the public has of earth sciences. We live on the earth. Why don't you want to understand how your house operates, right? So, so let me, if I could, um you know, and, and I'm going to go um, out on a limb here and, and respectfully suggest to the committee um, an, an idea. Um, and it starts with a story. Um, you know, the fundamental physics of um, magnetic resonance were um, worked out by some physicists at Columbia working um, independently of some physicists at Berkeley uh, back in the early 1930s. And it won, won them some Nobels, um, but it took until the 1970s before that knowledge um, was used to build the first MRI. And, um, you know, I told that story to a, uh, a local um, Congress uh, congressman uh, from Pennsylvania um, when I was at Penn State uh, a couple of, about well, three years ago. And, and he said, wow. That's the best story I've heard of the importance of doing fundamental um, research that is not known to have any particular usefulness, um, but that ultimately it, it, it revolutionized uh, diagnostic medicine. And so my, my question to you is, um, in, in, as you write the, this very important um, you know, survey for us, um, could you spend a little bit of time thinking about exactly those kinds of stories that make 
phenomenal sidebars, um, boxes to put in the, um, in the report because that, that's inspirational and it, uh, and it, it shouldn't be all that difficult for you to think of, um, you know, a few of those kinds of, um, you know, real watershed moments. No pun intended. Um, mine will be short, I think. I think yeah. Bowler's having a worse time right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, mine is actually very pragmatic in that, in listening, I've I've heard about the COPE project. There was there was emphasis on the NNA, uh, and then I just learned about the water quality and availability discussions taking place. And one of the things that I'm concerned about, maybe we all are, um, is that our report is fully aware of what NSF is doing. So you don't say, hey, there's an exciting thing. We're saying, yeah, we're doing that. So. I've gone to the web page many, many times, and some things they're, they're changing, and some things that are on there are no longer on there. And so, are, are there some things that are in the that you can talk about that are in the middle of ideas that are coming forward that are sort of in the stage of debating, discussing that we should hear about, we should know about that maybe hasn't made it onto your web page or something like that? Because I, I want to make sure that we're aware of things cooking. And NSF, so that we can either come, you know, connect to it or not be redundant. Is there, are there other ones that, that you would want to add? I mean, you know, this is really um, just sharing uh, pillow talk, you know, right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's it's um, it's it's just the kinds of uh, really wonderful conversations that uh, that we have around NSF um, that. That kind of circle the kinds of um, the way you're asking this yeah. question, um, and I'll I'll have my my say, and then I'll turn it to uh, Lena for the you know a little bit more of the earth sciences um, perspective. But you know we we have watched with um, with real awe at um, some of the um, big discoveries that have been made um, in the earth sciences. In the last, um, you know, few years, that um, that were only possible because we had new observing technologies that gave us access to either different areas um, or different seasons that have um, dramatically changed um, our thinking about um, how the Earth works. And and I'll give you an example. Um, Jorge Sarmiento's um, soccer work, um, you know, on the Southern Oceans, where, as you all know, probably better than I, the, um, the you know, most of the um, measurements of uh, carbon um, in the Southern Oceans was possible only by, um, you know, shipborne uh, observations and only in certain parts of the year when the ships could uh, gain access to the uh, far, far Southern Ocean. And um, and on the basis of those um, sparse observations, we had um, reached a you know I think a fairly reasonable conclusion that the Southern Oceans may very well have been the so-called missing sink of uh, carbon, and that um, that 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 we had more or less balanced the carbon cycle, and um, and yet Jorge with. Um, the use of gliders um, that uh, gave us access to observations um, at depth um, along the ice margins um, in, in, in the you know Antarctica and the um, the, the far southern ocean in winter um, yielded a very different story that um, that there are suggestions from his work that uh, maybe the southern oceans are are basically um, neutral. Um, when you look at the, uh, the the wintertime observations, so you know there's more work to be done before anything really conclusive can be uh, drawn. But the important point that is um, that I want to make here is that um, that with the use of um, intelligent um, machine learning based um, sensors that give us access 
to different times of year, different places, um, give us the ability to, um, you know, find in the ocean a, uh, a chemical gradient and um, and to begin to follow it and sense it and um, and and be smart enough to look for other species as it um, as it goes um, has has the potential to um, give us great leaps in understanding of some of these more complex systems like the carbon cycle and so um, th- we're we're asking in geo is it time to engage the engineering community along with uh, the earth sciences community to take advantage of this um, new technology and to um, begin to adapt you know, a, a, a zero order um, step would be just to adapt some of the market um, sensors, um, you know, with some um, ingenious, um, you know, um, uh, modifications that give us the ability to ask some of these really, um, you know, um, big questions and expect to see something different come because we have access to um, areas that we never had before. So that's that's an area that, you know, just because I'm describing it in very general terms, you can tell that it's it's not very well developed, but it is at the very edge of our thinking. Yes, yes. Well, I, I just I don't have much to add, uh, really. Um, I think you, the committee has done a, a very thorough job of kind of understanding the current landscape. Things are a little bit um, stable at the moment because we just launched the big ideas. We were that was kind of the, um, the first part. So we are in in that kind of actually good time for the committee to you know what the landscape is, and then as community members, as you talk to your communities, will be dreaming for what what should be the next part. The part of what I ask is that in your presentation to us when we started, you said that the the quote was the division is in transition. Oh, uh, uh, le- leadership transition. It was primary leadership. Yep. Okay, that's what I was. I was sort of. I looked at note and thought, okay, what does this mean? So it's just leadership, not that you have other things happening. Okay. Well, uh, and we we had uh, ended la- uh, Earthscope. Yes. Um, yes. The CCOs were coming to a new phase. That's yes. nice public. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's what I, I meant okay. uh, in November. I <laughs> Practical, different question now. So, in terms of this public outreach communication, it seems like there is an issue for EAR at least. I mean, issue, something that could be done better. So, what could you suggest beyond just saying we should communicate our science to the program officers? We all write broader impacts and we all do that already. So, what can we as a committee say that's broader? If you have any suggestions, no, not to put you on the spot now. But. Oh, again, I'm, I'm a true believer of partnerships, so taking advantage of the professional uh, organizations that they organize, we cannot advocate, right? As, as, as a federal employee, we cannot organize visits, but we, we can suggest names for congressional briefings and, and things like that. So um, I grew up in a time where, where communicating my science outside the scientific enterprise mm-hmm. was not encouraged. I wasn't taught how to do it. There were not frameworks. Now, now those frameworks exist, and I said, let's take advantage because I think we'll be dreaming, and we're branding too, right? NASA has a brand name. NSA have had an issue with branding, and the new, this new leadership in the Office of Public Affairs, they're very, very um, heavy on, on branding. So airplanes, any anything that NSA support now has a big NSF logo. So we're trying to also brand uh, NSF. It is quick, yeah. It seems to me it's become the norm now for all academic institutions to have a communications office that develops these stories. And I think we just need to make sure that we take whatever the people at the university write up to brag about us and convey it to NSF. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike, because, um, you know, I, one of the things that um, causes great indigestion at, um, at NSF is, um, is when, um, you know, some of the great science that, um, that you're doing, uh, you collectively, the royal you, are doing, um, 
in the um, in the research institutions um, is 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 written up in a very beautiful uh, way and um, and the and is conveyed in a way that's clearly um, meant for the um, you know the public and um, and 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 other uh, stakeholders to um, to understand. And yet NSF is left out of the uh, the equation, and um, and it just it it really um, you know we we really need that um, recognition, not 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 just so that we can polish our you know vests, but but because um, we we really depend on it to um, as a currency, if you will, to when we go to the hill and talk about the value of the science that we support. Okay, I, I really want to thank. Um Bill and Lena for spending so much time with us, and um, I think we'll uh, go ahead and break now and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully convene, reconvene a closed session in 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And thanks very much for, for sharing. Thank, thank you all. I really appreciate all that you're doing here. It's um, really, I'm, I'm really excited to see what you produce. And if I can be helpful again in the future at any other juncture, please, please call on me. Same here, and uh, we're really looking forward to what you will have to say. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out if we can be of further assistance.